Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum my dear students. Today we are going to uh, talk about the third phase in the history of English literature that is known as the Renaissance period or the age of Shakespeare and there is one more name that is the Elizabethan period. Okay my dear students as previously we were talking about uh, you know uh, the Anglo-Saxon period in the history of English literature and the Anglo-Norman period. Anglo-Saxon period is also known as uh, the Old English period and Anglo-Norman period is known as the medieval period. Uh, period of English literature. Renaissance period, this is uh, entirely a new approach, so we will talk about it in detail. It was started in 1500 and ended up in 1600. So it is, uh, you can say, uh, Renaissance period in the history of English literature is comprised of uh, one century. This is your, as you know, this is your history of English literature class and today's lecture is lecture number seven. First of all, as I usually tell you the course, are, uh, the lecture outline, so today we'll talk about Elizabethan period. What do you mean by the Elizabethan period or the Renaissance period or the Shakespearean age? And then what was the situation in England, as I told you many times before, like uh, different situations which are involved in, in the formulation of literature, background of those situations, that is very much important. Renaissance and humanism. This uh, is another moment which was going on in Italy at that time and literature in this period and then after you know uh, giving you the brief introduction to the literature of that period then we'll go for discussing poetry, drama and prose of Elizabethan age and then there will be a summary. Basically my dear students here let me clarify one point whenever I say Renaissance or Elizabethan or Shakespearean age. So definitely these three, uh, you know, names are not for different ages. These are uh, uh, synonyms, you can say, for each other. Elizabethan period, that is also known as the Renaissance period or the age of Shakespeare. Why that is the age of Shakespeare? Was uh, there only Shakespeare present at that time? Like uh, uh, he used to write uh, uh, comedies or tragedies. Uh, he was the only poet of that time, not at all. He was the most dominating figure of that era. That is why this is known as the age of Shakespeare. So when we were doing introduction to the history of English literature, so at that time I told you like uh, we give uh, different periods, different names according to the dominating figures of that period or according to any literary movement which was going on in any particular country or according to the centuries as well or according to the political conditions of that that very country fine so Elizabethan period definitely we are involving politics of, over here because uh, Queen Elizabeth was in rule at that time Renaissance period because this is uh, an Italian world so I'll tell you what do you mean by Renaissance okay Renaissance period was started in 1500 and it was ended in 1600. So it is uh, based on a full-fledged uh, one history. Okay, so this is known as Elizabethan period or the age of Shakespeare. Renaissance means the revival of learning. Okay, so my dear students here you can see that this is the revival of learning. Gradual enlightenment of the human mind after the darkness of the Middle Ages. So here you can see that how they are rejecting the philosophy of the Middle Ages, uh, the Anglo-Norman period. So my dear students, here you can see that there was a gradual enlightenment and they brought uh, a human into the modern era and they are saying that the middle ages they were full of darkness, okay? And that was the revival of learning as well, okay? The Renaissance that was a movement, it was begin in Italy, especially in art and architecture in 15th century. So my dear students here you can see that the Renaissance period it has a, it is strongly linked with with the you know um, the Renaissance period in England it is strongly linked with the Renaissance in Italy and that was a movement which was going on in Italy in the 15th century and this movement particularly dealt with the, with the revolution in art and architecture. As England became the most powerful nation in Europe in the late 16th century, new worlds were discovered and new ways of seeing and thinking developed. So here my dear students you can see that England was the most powerful nation of Europe, okay? 
and uh, it became the most powerful na uh, nation of the Europe in the late 16th century. My, stu my students, here you can see. And new worlds were discovered. There were no, too, many, too many new discoveries going on at that time. And those new discoveries and many other things, many other things, uh, they totally, you know, changed the, uh, the people's perception about the world. And you can say it was entirely a new age, okay? Okay, with the fall of Constantinople in 1453 AD, by the invasion of the Turks, the Greek scholars who were residing there spread all over the world. So here, my dear students, you can see that the, with the fall of this movement, and uh, that very area was invaded by the Turks, and uh, the Greek scholars who were residing there at that time, they were, uh, you know, uh, spread all over the all over Europe. Okay. So here, my dear students, you have to keep in mind, uh, like a uh, Renaissance period is strongly linked with the Greek scholars, okay? So we'll talk about their writings and uh, how they brought, uh, you know, a revolution in the literature. They brought with them invaluable uh, uh, Greek manuscripts. So my dear students here you can see like uh, when they uh, came uh, to Europe so here you can say they brought with them the Greek uh, uh, you know manuscripts as well their writings their literature okay the discovery of these classical models resulted in the revival of, revival of learning in 14th and 15th century so here my dear students you can see when they came to England so they brought with them uh, their classics and you know their literature with them so that is why there is the revival of learning uh, in England at that time and that is known as the Renaissance period in the history of English literature as well fine I hope you are getting the point this Renaissance is uh, uh, not at all difficult to understand this is just a name of the period and you can call it the Elizabethan age so, or the age of Shakespeare as well what what is basically uh, the main motive of the renaissance movement man discovered himself and the universe so basically here you can see the, our focus is on man that he discovered the universe and himself as well fine so man so long blinded had suddenly opened his so long sorry repeating the second point man so long blinded had suddenly opened his eyes and seen so basically this blindness or you can say the blinded man we are referring here to the mid middle ages okay and the dark ages according to the renaissance scholar so here you can see that man at that time he was blind and now he has suddenly opened uh, his eyes and now he can see the realities of the world okay previously he was just blind he was living in the dark ages okay where there were just imagination and you know the world was based on fantasy in literature okay the flood of greek literature carried swiftly to every school in europe so here my, my dear student you can see that the greek uh, scholars uh, they brought with them the you know the greek uh, writings so they uh, you know mm, they were spread all over the europe okay with the passage of time gradually okay and there was a flood like here you can see the use of the metaphor here okay it revealed a new world of poetry and philosophy so here during the renaissance period we are entering into uh, an entirely new world of poetry and of philosophy because of the uh, influence of the greek uh, writings on english literature okay along with the revival of learning new discoveries took place so that that was not just the revival of the learning or uh, or you can say the revolution in learning or in philosophy or poetry side by side there were too many other discoveries which were going on Vasco da Gama Sukuman navigated okay the earth okay so he was the person who introduced the concept okay and Columbus discovered America we are talking about uh, the renaissance period in history of english literature okay and meanwhile these uh, discoveries was, were also going on copernicus discovered the solar system and prepared the way for galileo so here my dear students you can see that it was for the first time when the solar system was prepared and uh, you know this person uh, provided the way for galileo as well okay 
books were printed so here my dear student you can see that previously books were in manuscript they were handwritten okay so here books were printed because uh, the printing uh, uh, machine came into uh, focus there and they invented this machine as well okay books were printed and philosophy and science and art were systematized so here my dear students you can see that with the with the invasion of uh, you know the printing machine now it was uh, not that much hectic task to write down everything of literature and then uh, uh, send it here and there so in that way like after printing machine what happened that the books of philosophy science uh, and art they were spread all over europe and everywhere fine so beca because it was uh, like uh, naturally it bec it becomes uh, you know an easy task to uh, you know uh, to give your books to anybody scholars flocked to the university so those were as previously we were talking about the greek scholars so they were flocked to the universities okay different european universities where they used to talk about their culture about their writings because they brought uh, you know their um, their literature with them okay new spirit in europe with the revival of learning so when they went here and there in different universities so here my dear students you can see that uh, there was a new spirit in your europe with the revival of learning so my dear students here you what you have to keep in mind is that Uh, the concept is the revival of learning okay a new flood of uh, learning you can say which uh, greek scholars they brought with them when they came to europe okay what was the situation in england at that time an important change in religion and politics so here previously we were talking about literature and you know the revival of learning so we are going in another direction right now that is the revival or you know you can say the revolution in the political situation and in in the religion uh, of england as well at that time king henry 8th became head of church in england and state so he was a protestant fine so he became head of church in england and uh, head of state as well so he was a king he was a political leader and because he was powerful so he became the head of the church as well no contact with catholic church so previously uh, church was catholic okay it was under the uh, catholic priest so now Hen henry henry 8 so when he when he uh, came into power so he became the church head of the church so he became the head of the church protestantism became more important okay so here as i told you that henry 8 henry 8 he was a political figure as well as the religious figure as well so he was not at all a priest or a pope but still he became the head of the church and he was a protestant as well so protestantism became more important why because of the power nobody was uh, allowed to perform you know catholic uh, religion activities in the church and that is why everybody in the church like they they used to perform their uh, you know religious activities according to the uh, protestantism protestantism okay according to protestantism okay whole uh, new uh, vision of man's relation with god so here my dear students uh, um, we can say that the whole vision of man the relation with the god uh, was changed uh, after this thing in england okay when henry uh, 8 became head of the church so he brought these uh, things in the church as well and in in politics he was already the king over there he became the head of the church okay and then what happened that he entirely changed the concept of the people and their relationship with the god okay renaissance and humanism this is another terminology and this was a, a literary movement that was started in uh, by dante in italy patriarch and vicario in 14th century so basically these were the pioneers of the movement humanism so i'll tell you in detail what do we mean by humanism okay humanism this concept was uh, uh, popular during the elizabethan period okay so my dear students here you can see that the renaissance has an effect of the renaissance movement which was going uh, in uh, italy and it has an effect of uh, humanism as well fine so here my dear students you can see like um, 
The movement which focused its interest on the proper study of mankind had a number of subordinate trends as well. So basically this movement had focused on the proper study of mankind. So basically the, the man was the central point of this movement and it had so many you know subordinate trends as well. So this was the basic trend of that movement. Okay. The rediscovery of uh, classical antiquity and particularly of ancient Greece. Okay, the, the medieval period, the tradition bound Europe had forgotten the liberal tone of old Greek world and its spirit of democracy and human dignity. That is why medieval period in the history of English literature during the Renaissance period they gave it a name of the Dark Ages or the uh, you can say the age, age of the forgotten nation okay so according to the renaissance scholar the medieval period they totally forgot you know the liberal tone of old greek world so they think that the old, the, the old greek world was very liberal but the medieval period the dark ages in the history of english literature they forgot the liberal tone of the Greek scholars and its spirit of democracy and human dignity. So basically they forgot all these traditions of the old Greek world, its spirit of democracy and its human dignity as well. So now in Renaissance, I hope you are getting the things because as uh, many times uh, I told you that you have to take the things in a story form, okay? So the medieval period, as I told you that, uh, you know, uh, with the passage of time and new literary movements, uh, they came uh, in England. So here you can say that they, uh, they used to reject the previous movements or the previous period. So, okay. So what you have to keep in mind here is that the old Greek world, the thing that is full of uh, democracy and that is full of human dignity. So medieval period, the Anglo-Norman period, they forgot all the things of the old Greek world. Okay, So that is why this is known as the revival of learning. Previously, all Greek con concepts were there. During the medieval period, they forgot everything, and now during the Renaissance period, that is the revival of learning in that sense. Okay, with the revival of interest in classical Greek classical antiquity, the new spirit of humanism made its impact on the Western world. So here you can see why this is known as the revival of learning or the revival of interest because uh, they were quite uh, successful in uh, creating an impact on the Western world. People who were living in Europe in England, fine. The first Englishman, Sir Thomas More, uh, he wrote Utopia and that was written in Latin. So here, my dear student, you can see that the literature that was uh, in Greek, uh, most of the literature was in Greek and Latin because of the influence of the humanism or the Renaissance movement. Okay, So he wrote Utopia and that was written in Latin was suggested by Plato's Republic okay so basically the theme or the concept was taken by the Plato's book that was Republic so Philip Sidney in his defense of poesy accepted and advocated the critical rules of the ancient Greeks so here my dear student you can see that for the first time Sir Thomas More he wrote Utopia and he was the first Englishman who wrote uh, you know uh, something uh, in Latin for the first time and it had the great themes, uh, it had the basic themes uh, from Plato's Republic and then Sir Philip Sidney. So my dear friends here you have to keep in mind two names only, Sir Thomas More and Sir Philip Sidney and their works Utopia and Defense of Poesy. So here you can see that Latin is here and in defense of poetry he accepted and educated the critical rules of the ancient Greeks. So for the first time as I told you why you know here you can see that they they had forgotten the liberal tone of the old Greek. So here you can see that this is the revival of uh, the ancient Greek uh, traditions and rules once again and that was presented by Sir Philip Sidney in his defense of poesy. The second important aspect of humanism was the discovery of the external universe and its significance for man. So this is the second important aspect of humanism that there is an external world as well and previously you can see that everything was based on imagination on fantasy and they were just man okay so here you can see that the external universe is also present here and its significance for man as uh, 
uh, I'm telling you, you know, the man was uh, uh, at the center of, uh, you know, everything and the external universe that is also there, okay? But most important than this was the writers directed their gaze inward and became deeply interested in the problems of human personality. So, the writers, they changed their trends here and they uh, they were uh, too inclined towards the human personality and their problems so the focus was on the human personality and on their problems okay you can see that in medieval we are doing uh, the comparison of uh, you can say the medieval plays and the renaissance plays as well in medieval morality plays i gave you the briefing on you know morality plays and the miracle plays and the tradition was very much common among the writers uh, of you know medieval ages of the anglo norman period fine so here my dear, dear students say uh, you can say that you know uh, the characters are mostly personified so i told you the definition of personification as well when you give uh, human attributes to any you know known living object that is known as the personification okay so basically they were not true you can say according to the renaissance scholars they were not true and uh, you know when we draw the contrast of uh, you know both the periods in the history of english literature so you can say that most of the characters they were personified they were not real character fine in the Elizabethan period, in the Renaissance period, the emphasis was laid on the qualities which distinguish one human being from another and given an individuality and uniqueness. So here basically you can see that uh, that is a competition among human beings as well. Like uh, the focus was basically on the human qualities which distinguish one human being from another. So here, my dear students, you can see like uh, in drama, in uh, Elizabethan drama, you can see like uh, there there is uh, you know a competition among uh, the human beings like the qualities which, which distinguish one human being from another and uh, give an individuality and uniqueness as well like uh, a man is responsible for his deeds and action so this was quite a, you can say a unique concept as well so here my dear students what you have to note down is that that like previously in uh, in medieval ages or in uh, anglo normal period the characters are more mostly personified okay so here our focus is on the qualities okay of human beings and it gives an individuality and uniqueness concept as well fine so you have to keep in mind two things in the medieval period of in the history of english literature the characters were usually personified but here the characters are real and uh, basically the concept was to tell you uh, during this period how to live in the society and the external there is an external universe as well which is here and when we talk about personification when we give the human attributes uh, and the qualities to any known living objects so basically we just delimited okay and here we are involving during the renaissance period we are involving the external universe in our literature as well fine the people who are living in the society or you can say like external forces which are there fine so basically that that was the difference between the medieval and the renaissance period Literature in Renaissance period, this ten tendency led to the rise of the new literary form. So new literary form here, we are not following any, you know, uh, previous tradition, oh, sorry. We are not following here any, my dear students here, you can see like uh, when we talk about literature in uh, renaissance period so we are not following any old movement any old literary form so we'll uh, talk about in in detail the first kind of uh, thing which was very much common during the renaissance period was that of essay fine which was used successfully by bacon fine so my dear students here what you have to keep in mind that bacon is uh, you know famous for essays okay he is famous for essay writing in drama this is another big thing okay so Marlowe and Shakespeare Marlowe basically in drama probed down into the deep recesses of the human patient his heroes Tamburlaine, uh, Dr. Foster, Barbaras, the Jew of Malta are possessed of uncontrolled ambitions so basically here we are talking about the uncontrolled ambitions of human beings as well fine 
we have to keep in mind the previous concept of the climax and the fall and you know uh, uh, fall and then the resolution which we discussed in the last class when so here my dear students you can say that uh, the essay it was a very common thing in during the renaissance period and bacon bacon sorry and bacon and bacon was uh, you know uh, the prominent figure as far as essay writing was concerned okay marlow another uh, important figure in the history of english literature during the elizabethan period uh, like as far as drama is concerned was that was marlow okay so here my dear students you can see like these are the heroes of his different plays okay and uh, you know those who possess, possess you know the uncontrolled ambitions and then there would be a fall okay so here students you can see our focus would be on the external universe and the factors which are involved in uh, in making human uh, ambitious about something and the uncontrolled ambitions which are not in your control and which are full of lust as well and shakespeare the very prominent figure in the elizabethan period carried humanism to perfection so basically he took the concept from humanism and he ca carried this concept to towards a perfection so that is why this uh, whole period is known as uh, the age of shakespeare as well renaissance and humanism what is basically uh, the relationship of renaissance with humanism okay so here do, do, my dear students i'll just explain the uh, the core concepts of humanism basically this was a movement which was going on in italy fine so what happened like uh, the thing when uh, the italian and the greek scholars they they came to europe so what happened over there the thing that the medieval why they do do they call medieval ages the dark period in the history of english literature because they they have forgotten all the old traditions of the greek time fine so here this is the revival of the learning so here they are you know uh, introducing those uh, traditions again fine in english society these are the important aspects of you know the relationship of humanism and renaissance sensitiveness of formal beauty that was the first point cultivation of aesthetic sense okay castiglione wrote a treatise entitled uh, entitled to castiglione and um, the english of this world is you know the quote here fine so here you can see that that humanism and renaissance uh, the deal with the sensitiveness of formal beauty and the cul cultivation of the aesthetic sense okay he sketched the pattern of uh, gentlemanly behavior and manners upon which the conduct of such men uh, men as sir philip sidney and sir wotel lair was model so here my dear students you can see basically he sketched he presented two models here one is that of uh, uh, sir philip sidney and the other one sir wotel so here you can see one thing like uh, how that is based on the real characters and that the characters are basically not personified he took the concept only fine so he sketched the pattern of gentlemanly behavior and the manners upon which the contact of such men as sir philip sidney and sir walter relic was modeled okay the cult of elegance in prose uh, writing produced the ornament style called euphemism by lely so here my dear students you can see that this this is uh, you know we are introducing two works over here one is uh, euphemism by lely and uh, the other one is cortigiano castigliano fine so here you can see like uh, they for the for, for the first time in the history of english literature during the renaissance uh, period they introduced the concept of humanism through their writings okay man come to be regarded as responsible for their own actions as uh, cecius says to uh, to brutus in julius caesar as well so here my dear students you can see that mm, julius caesar that was written by you know uh, william shakespeare so here the main focus of humanism was that that man is responsible for his or her own deeds nobody else is responsible although many factors are involved in formulation of any action but this is man who is responsible for his own deeds nothing else okay the fall dear brutus is not in our stars so here you can see this is a line from julius caesar 
the fold here Brutus is not in our stars but in ourselves that we are underlying sphinx so here my dear student you can see that he is directly saying that the fault is not in our stars the fault is not written in our fate the fault is uh, not something which is uh, done by somebody else we are responsible for our own deeds and for our own actions and the fault is within us not in any other external force okay my dear students now we are over with the renaissance and humanism that how that movement was started in italy by dante and other people so it has influence on english society as well okay and what were the what are the different aspects of renaissance and humanism and you know how this movement humanism it has strongly affected the, the writings of the renaissance period okay first of all we'll study uh, Elizabethan drama okay so Elizabethan drama or the Renaissance drama it got great development of the study of Latin because the dramas they were usually written in Latin language at that and the significant significance lies in the fact that they brought the educated class into touch with a much more highly developed kind of drama than the older English play so here my dear students you can see that here they are not representing any uh, any other class they basically they are bringing educated class into touch uh, in their dramas okay and uh, you can see the in the Elizabethan drama the, the heroes they are uh, highly qualified they are very educated and they are uh, you can say they are enlightened they are modern fine so here you can see that there is a shift uh, Previously in older English uh, play, like uh, maybe hero can be of any type, he was not the idealized uh, man, okay? So here we are involving the educated classes and, uh, you know, um, this is the highly developed kind of drama as well. So the drama uh, reached on it, its climax during the Elizabethan period, fine? Elizabethan drama, the three important plays of, the t of this type are Nicholas Udlas, the uh, Udlas, Ralph Royster, Doister. So this is a comedy that is written by Nicholas, okay? And then John Stills, Grammar, Gertens, Needle. So again, this is a comedy, okay? So my dear students here, you can see the repetition of the sounds as well. This is known as rep alliteration, as I told you in the last lecture, fine? So this is the repetition. That was also known as uh, comedy. Thomas Sequel's uh, Gerbudak or Ferric and uh, Porex. So that is uh, a tragedy and these are the most important plays of this type. Fine. So of which type basically when you bring the educated class into action and when your story is uh, you know very much mature and it's not like based on fantasy or the imaginative elements only. So dear students here you can see that these are you know the comedies and the tragedies which are written at that time. All these plays are monotones and do not possess much literary merit. So all of these are the important plays but they are written in one tone only you'll find the same theme in all the you know comedies or in all the tragedies and uh, you know the typical story was there so you you can say that these plays they do not possess much literary merit they they could not go up to the higher level as you can see you know uh, the popularity of the Elizabethan plays like other plays uh, Shakespearean plays or Marlowe plays fine the second period of Elizabethan drama was dominated by the university where so here you can see this is the second period. Previously, when we were talking about the three important plays, two comedies and one tragedy, those plays, those are written in the monotone. That was the first period in of drama in Elizabethan age. Fine. The second period of Elizabethan drama was dominated by the university words. So, here, my dear students, you can see the university words. What do we mean by basically university words? A professional set of literary men. They were all educated and the. They used to write things, okay? Marlowe was the central son. Basically, it was Marlowe who was the central son. And uh, around uh, him, 
revolved as minor stars like lily green peel lodge and nash so here my dear students you can see that marlow was the most dominating figure of that time and he was among the university wears and what do we mean by university wears a professional set of literary men and uh, you know there were too many other stars as well in in university wears lily green pele lodge and nash okay Lele. First of all, we'll talk about Lele, and his period is comprised uh, from uh, of you know 1554 to 1606. Okay, he was the author of Euphues. As I told you, euphemism, the term euphemism previously, the uh, the author of Euphues. Okay, his best known works are Compass, Sappho, and Fau, Fain, Andymion, and Midas. So these are the best works which were written by Lele. these plays are uh, mythological they are based upon any any particular uh, particular kind of myth and myth and usually that was greek myth okay they are written in prose intermingled with verse basically this they were written in prose but some of the uh, some of the portions of uh, the works so they are uh, written in verse as well so here you can see the combination of uh, you know prose and verse you can find in the elizabethan drama as well the the verse is simple and charming prose is mirrored by exaggeration a characteristics of uh, euphemism so here the combination of verse and prose is there and which is the characteristic of euphemism as well when you combine the things together you are not restricted to one domain of writing literature either poetry or prose fine so here that is the combination of prose and verse and that is the main characteristic of euphemism as well george peel an actor as well as the writer of the plays so he used to play uh, roles uh, himself as well so he was the writer of the plays so his six plays are richer in beauty than any of the other university wears except marlow his honest work is the arraignment of paris so here my dear students you can see the george peel his this work is very much important and there is one more which is important that is david and but shaba fine so these are basically the two works which he wrote during the period lisbethian period okay so basically my dear students here you you'll have to notice one thing that there were many other university wits as well okay like uh, lely was also one of the university wits george peel is also but he is a uh, a prominent one of the prominent figures as well and he got the popularity as well and you know he was lower than the Mar uh, he was sorry he was lower than marlow sorry he was lower than Mar marlow but he was higher than other university wits and these are his famous works okay the arrangement of paris which contains an elaborative eulogy of queen elizabeth so basically that was the character in this work uh, was that of the Queen Elizabeth, and you have to keep in mind that here we are talking about the Elizabethan period in the history of English literature as well. Fine. Thomas Kyd achieved great great popularity with his first work, the Spanish tragedy, which was translated in many European languages. So basically, his first tragedy, like that, was the Spanish. Uh, the name of the tragedy was the Spanish tragedy, and it was his first work, and it was translated in many. other languages european languages It introduced the blood and thunder element in drama which proved one of the attractive features of the pre shakespearean drama so here my dear students we are not still on shakespeare the most dominating figure in the elizabethan page we are talking about other writers of uh, that page but our focus is on elizabethan drama right now so he, for the very first time in uh, elizabethan drama he introduced the concept of blood and thunder like of violence uh, of killing the man and which was uh, prominent in Uh, Shakespearean drama as well, and these are the attractive features as well in order to create suspense and uh, to create horror uh, and to create horror in the society. Fine. Robert Greene, another figure, his plays comprise uh, Orlando uh, Furioso, Friar Bacon, and Friar Bungay. Alphonsus King of uh, Aragon and George A Green so basically his plays are uh, these uh, he wrote these plays basically he wrote these plays most dominating play is friar baking and friar bangay deals with the tricks of the friar and partly with a simple love story between two men and uh, 
between two men with one maid. So my dear students here you can see that this was the most dominating play that was written by Rob, Robert Greene and basically that was a that deals with the trick of the friar and uh, that was partly a love story as well and that story was uh, between two men and one maid. It's a variety of interest in comic relief and to the entertainment of the audience. So basically these stories are very much interesting, okay, like uh, in form of love story, in form of uh, light romance, how they presented certain other things which are present in the society. So here students you have to Keep in mind uh, one more thing that is uh, through uh, by developing the interest of the of the readers how they develop the entertainment uh, factor as well among the audience. Okay, Christopher Marlowe, mm. one of the most uh, you know uh, after Shakespeare you can say Marlowe took his place and he is the prominent figure in the Elizabethan age. In 1587, his pa first play. Tambourine was uh, produced and it took place by storm an account of its uh, uh, impetuous force, its splendid command of blank walls and its sensitiveness to beauty. So here my dear students uh, you can see that this is the first play that was written by Marlowe. Tambourine, okay. So here you can say that uh, he has a command of uh, a command on using blank words in uh, his writing and uh, he has the sense of uh, you know feeling the beauty as well so that is why it like it came like a storm in england okay Tamburlaine was succeeded by the tragical history of Dr. Faustus in which Marlowe gave an old medieval legend a romantic setting. So basically the setting was romantic but basically the concept was from the old medieval legend, okay, Dr. Faustus, okay. So the tragical history of Dr. Faustus is uh, again one of the important works which were written by Marlowe, okay. Basically uh, you will deal with Dr. Faustus in future as well. This is a story of the scholar who sells his soul to the devil for worldly enjoyment and unlimited power is presented in a most fascinating manner. Okay, so here you can see basically this is a story of a scholar who sells his soul to the devil. So previously he was a noble man, he was a scholar, he was an educated man. But due to his, you know, high uh, wishes in the society, he sold his soul to the devil, okay. Marlowe's Faustus is the genuine incarnation of the Renaissance spirit. So here you can see, like, if you watch the movie Dr. Faustus, or if you see, sorry, if you read, the novel doctor oh, sorry if you read the draw if you read the play dr foster so here my dear students you can see that it, it is a true lef reflection of the renaissance spirit spirit okay so here dear students you can see that um, how he has presented an old medieval legend with a romantic setting okay the Jew of Malta, basically, this was his uh, third tragedy, and uh, you know, it was not so fine as Dr. Faustus was. And his last play, that was uh, Edward I, from the technical point of view, it was the best play, but it lacks uh, the force and the dramatic beauty of the earlier, earlier plays. So, here, dear students, you can see that previously we were talking about that Marlowe has the command of using blank words, so that command is. Uh, uh, not present here. It is superior to them on account of its rare skill of construction and admirable characterization. So why this, uh, you know, Edward II play is important? It is because of uh, its uh, rare skill of construction and admirable characterization. So both the aspects are important. That is why it was popular uh, play. Marlowe raised the subject matter of drama to a higher level. So previously, he entirely changed the subject matter of the uh, higher level. Previously, like uh, when we talk about the medieval ages of the Anglo-Saxon period in the history of English literature, so it was what? The subject matter was entirely different. Most of the characters, they were personified. But here, Marlowe changed the concept. Okay, He introduced heroes who were men of great strength and vitality possessing the renaissance characteristics of uh, 
insatiable spirit of adventure so his heroes are basically very adventurous people and uh, they are very educated and they are great uh, men you can say and they possess the renaissance uh, spirit as well so previously like it was not necessary in them during the medieval ages dark ages it was not that much common that the hero was uh, hero always used to possess these qualities so it was basically the hero if we talk about uh, the hero of uh, his place so they all possess uh, certain uh, noble qualities and they are very down to earth as well and they are very courageous people he has been rightly called the father of english dramatic poetry so Chaucer is the father of English poetry, but when we talk about the father of dramatic, uh, who is the father of uh, English dramatic poetry, so definitely the answer is Marlowe. Shakespeare, Shakespearean age, as uh, we talked about it many times. Okay, Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets, so this is a, a kind of poetry sonnets. Okay. 37 plays. His work as a dramatist extended over, uh, over some 24 years, beginning with uh, 1588 and ending about 1612. Okay, his work is generally divided into four periods. So basically, why Shakespeare is important? We are not going to focus on Shakespeare's personality here, fine, because we do not have much record of uh, his personality because at that time they didn't have the tradition of writing biographies or autobiographies. That's why we don't have the written record of Shakespeare's life with us okay so we have divided Shakespeare's work into four periods number one period that was uh, comprised of his early experimental work to this period belonged the revision of old plays uh, three parts of Henry fourth and Titus so here you can see that the experimental it was not that much refined work during the first period okay and uh, you can say his first comedies love labor lost the two gentlemen of verona the comedy of uh, errors and miss summer night's dream so here you can see his first comedies he introduced during the first periods and these are all the you know uh, the comedies his first chronicle play that was in the chronicle where richard three was introduced during the first period a youthful tragedy of romeo and juliet was also introduced in the period once so dear students here you can see that how we have divided uh, Shakespeare Shakespeare's works into four different periods the first period is that of the experimental work and where he wrote uh, Henry uh, six and Titus uh, Titus and Renesis his first comedies were you know uh, the love label host and so on fine and he his first chronicle play as well Richard three and a youthful tragedy that is uh, Romeo and Juliet so this is basically his experimental work and this work is not as as much refined as his uh, later works would be so here basically my dear students will focus on uh, period two okay he wrote his great comedies and chronicle plays during this period okay so here dear students you can see that the plays uh, which uh, he wrote okay these were Richard II, King John, The Merchant of Venice, Henry IV Part 1 and 2 and then Henry V, The Taming of the Shrew, The Merry Wives of uh, Windsor, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It and Twelfth Night. These plays reveal Shakespeare's great development as a thinker and technician as well so these are the very good works which were written by Shakespeare's all the plays okay the third period Shakespeare's greatest tragedies and somber or bitter comedies as well here he is more concerned with the darker side of human experience and its destructive passion so basically here you can see that Shakespeare has become uh, very negative okay and uh, he focused on the darker side of uh, human experience and its destructive passions fine even in comedies the tone is grave and there is a great emphasis on evil so basically his tra tragedies are based on evil and those are based upon the you know can, you can say Aristotle tragedies as well fine even in his comedies so that was the case about uh, you know tragedies those were written by William Shakespeare when we talk about his com comedies you can say the great emphasis was still on evil the plays of the periods are Julius Caesar, Hamlet, All Well That Ends Well, Okay, Mayor of Mayor, uh, Troilus and Cressida, Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus and 
Timon of Athens. So these are basically his greatest tragedies and comedies. So here you can see the darker side of human beings in all the comedies and in tragedies as well during the third period. Okay, the fourth period, the later comedies or dramatic romances. A changed mood previously he was used to be a very negative person who you know observed the darker sides of human beings only all the evils in the society so here basically he has changed his mood the plays written during this period are Sambaline, uh, the temples the winter's tale so here my dear student you can see that the change of the mood is here previously he was used to be very negative but now he uh, he was writing during the fourth period he was writing comedies and dramatic romances as well. These were completely written in collaboration with some other dramatists as well. So we don't have the proper record. Those were the dramatists of that time who collaborated with Shakespeare. Fine, but this is understood that he collaborated with other writers in order to write these, you know, comedies and dramatic romances. Fine, so. My dear students, you just have to keep in mind the four periods uh, uh, relevant to Shakespeare in the Elizabethan age of English literature. Fine. Ben Jonson, another important figure in the history of English literature, he is a contemporary of Shakespeare and a prominent dramatist of his time. So he is also one of the prominent prominent dramatists of that time. He is the opposite of Shakespeare. I'll tell you why. Okay, he was a classist a moralist and a reformer of drama in his comedies he tried to present the true picture of the contemporary society so he didn't say anything which was fake or which was not based on reality actually the same picture was is there in his uh, dramas uh, as he found in the contemporary society he also made an attempt to have the entities of time, plays, and actions in his plays. So basically, these are some of the important characteristics of his plays as well. So my dear students, after Shakespeare, we are dealing with Ben Jonson, that although he is the contemporary of Shakespeare, and he is a prominent figure in Elizabethan age, but he was just opposite of Shakespeare, okay? Some of the, you know, Jonson's comedies are Wolpon, The Silent Women, The Alchemist, okay, Bardolo Mew Fair, Man in his humor, every man out of humor, the alchemist. So here, my dear students, you can see that these are the comedies which are written by Ben Jonson during the Elizabethan era. Fine. Elizabethan poetry. Please, previously we were talking about Elizabethan drama, and we discussed Marlowe and you know some other university wits as well. But the prominent figures, uh, uh, as far as drama is concerned, during the Elizabethan period, they are. Shakespeare, Marlowe, and Ben Jonson. Okay, Elizabethan poetry. We'll focus on it now. This was a new trend. Okay, it was a poetry of the new age of discovery, enthusiasm, and excitement. Fine. So here, my dear students, I told you about the new discoveries which were going on during the Renaissance period as well. So it is basically the poetry of the new age. It is poetry of the discovery. It is poetry of the enthusiasm and excitement. So. It, that poetry didn't have the you know the previous theme or from the dark ages under the impact of the renaissance the english people were infused with freshness and vigor and these qualities are clearly reflected in poetry of their age so basically with the revival of the learning with the, a revolution in the literary world so people they were quite fresh and you know these qualities of uh, having freshness and uh, vigor attitude that these were reflected in the poetry of that age as well fine poetry in this age opens with publication of a volume known as turtles uh, Miscellany, okay, and that was published in 1577. This book contained the verse of Sir Thomas White and uh, the Earl of Surrey, okay. So basically, this uh, this is a combination of uh, you know uh, of the writings of uh, two poets. Uh, one is Sir Thomas White and the Earl of Surrey. It marks the first English poetry of the Renaissance. So basically, this publication, this volume, was known as the first. Uh, uh, you know English poetry in the Renaissance period. White and Surrey wrote a number of songs, especially sonnets, which uh, adhered to the Petrarchan model and which was later adopted by Shakespeare. So basically, they provided uh, basis for Shakespeare, okay, and the things which they adopted uh, while writing poetry later on, those were copied by Shakespeare. Not exactly copied, like these are adopted by Shakespeare. Fine. 
Another original writer belonging to the early Elizabethan group of poets was Sir Thomas Sickwell. So, my dear students, here you can see that Sir Thomas Sickwell also, uh, you know, possesses uh, a prominent place uh, in Elizabethan age. In his Mirror of Magistrates, he has given a powerful picture of the underworld where the poet describes his meetings uh, with some famous Englishmen who had been the victims of misfortune. So basically this is again you can say um, the story is based on the contemporary society and this is all about the story that he met a picture, uh, sorry, he met two Englishmen, sorry. He met some famous Englishmen and they were the victims of uh, mis misfortune. Okay, Sequel, unlike White and Saray, previously we were talking about White and Saray in the last slide, is not a cheerful writer but he is superior to them in poetic techniques. So basically, he was not a cheerful writer. He didn't write uh, any kind of romances or, you know, any kind of poetry which is uh, full of excitement or beauty. He, he highlighted the you know the other picture of um, you know the hidden picture of the society of the contemporary society the problems which are faced by the people of that society he addressed those problems in his work okay but he he was not uh, uh, sorry he was not basically he was not a cheerful uh, writer he was not a writer who uh, wrote his writings full of excitements or something like that but he is superior to them in poetic technique so as far as language is concerned that is quite refined and he is superior from white and saray uh, as far as the poetic te techniques are concerned the greatest early uh, elizabethan poet was basically sir philip sidney okay wrote prose and poetry both okay Prose works, his prose works are Arcadia and Apology for Poetry. With Arcadia, begins, uh, he begins a new kind of imaginative writing, though written in prose. It is strewn with long songs and sonnets. So basically, he was a prose writer and uh, he was a poet as well. So basically, this Arcadia, this is his prose work, and he, you know, mixed up different elements over there, and so combination of love songs and sonnets, and this is a kind of imaginative writing as well. The Apology for Poetry is first of the series of rare and very useful commentaries which some English poets have written about their art. So here students you can see this basically this uh, this apology of poetry is the first of series of the rare and very useful commentaries which some English poets have written about their art. So basically this is about uh, the English poets okay the way they used to write and the way they uh, you know judge their art of writing anything. Astrophel and Stella, the sequence of sonnets entitled in which Sidney celebrated the history of his love. So basically this is his poetic work Astrophel and Stella and this is a very important work in the entire history of English literature as well. So in Astrophel and Stella he presented the sequence of sonnets and uh, um, where he cel celebrated the history of his love. Basically, this is based upon his history of love or his love experience. Spencer, another important poet in Elizabethan age, his most important work is Fairy, The Fairy Queen, Shepherd's Calendar, another work consisting of 12 parts, each devoted to a month of the year. So basically, this Shepherd's calendar that is consisted of uh, you know 12 months and each month uh, it was uh, uh, devoted to a month of the year. Astrophel an allegory which he wrote on the death of Sydney to whom he has dedicated the calendar. So basically he dedicated the calendar and he wrote Astrophel after the death of Sydney. Okay? Four hymns which are characterized by melodious words were written by Spencer in honor of love and beauty. So in four hands basically appreciated love and beauty, okay? And Amorithi consisting of 88 sonnets, okay? And then Epithalamian, Epithalamian, and then Epithalamian is the most beautiful marriage hymn in the English language. So basically these are the contribution of uh, Spencer in English poetry in the Elizabethan base. He is uh, famous for the fairy queen and for the shepherd's calendar as well fine the third part of today's lecture that is the elizabethan poor, poor prose previously that was a 
Elizabethan, you know, drama, then poetry, and then our focus is on prose. Joan Lilly is one of the prose writers. The first author who wrote prose in the manner that the Elizabethan wanted was Lilly. Okay, basically, this is his work, a prose work. You first, fine. So here, my dear students, you can see that he was the first prose writer in Elizabethan period and he wrote according to the manners or the expectations of the Elizabethans as well, fine. And it was popular why? because of his decorative style, the way he, he, he used the language, uh, it's because of that one, you know, uh, he got popularity in all over the world. Elizabethan prose, Sydney's uh, Arcadia, this is Elizabethan prose, okay, first English example of post pastoral romance which was imitated by various English writers for about 200 years. So this is a, again very important work that was written by Sir Philip Sidney. Arcadia goes one degree beyond Euphys in the direction of freedom and poetry. So basically they would both follow the same themes but it is one step beyond okay the Euphys in the direction of freedom and poetry so basically you can see in Elizabethan prose we talked about Lily and here we are talking about Sydney and with uh, with our particular focus on, on his work Arcadia fine two other important writers who uh, among others influenced Elizabethan prose were Mallory and Heckler Mallory wrote a great prose romance Morte the author that dealt with the romantic treasure of the Middle Ages. So basically that was uh, about history that was based upon, upon the romantic treasures of the Middle Ages. Okay, And the other one, Richard uh, Hacklett's Voyages and other such books describing sea adventures uh, were written in simple and unaffected directness. So here basically we are focusing on two more prose writers Mallory and Richard fine so my dear students here you can see that first one his work uh, Mote the Outer uh, dealing with the romantic treasures of the Middle Ages so basically this is ab about the old ages oh sorry about the dark ages okay or the medieval ages and the second work uh, okay uh, that is uh, Voyages fine that was written by Richard Hackliard and this is uh, a book uh, this like uh, like other books it describes the sea adventure and which was written in simple and unaffected directness as well I'll just summarize today's lecture we took a start with what do we mean by Renaissance and what was the situation uh, of England during the Renaissance period and Renaissance and humanism fine and then the contribution of the great uh, authors in the Renaissance literature and in that literature we focused on dramas then on poetry and lastly on prose so that was all about Elizabethan literature you know how they shifted their uh, you know uh, their uh, focus from one point to another and why that happened due to the Greek writings fine and at the start they used to write their uh, literature in uh, Italian language but with the passage of time they shifted towards English language as well so here my dear students you can see like the different periods uh, how they are uh, you know different from each other why due to the political influence due to the religious influence and the other factors which are involved there because these factors they change the taste of the people of any society fine and plus uh, one more thing which is very much important is like how these factor, oh sorry, the, these literary works, they lead people to think in, uh, you know, any particular direction and how they build up their ideology. So hope uh, Elizabethan period or Renaissance period, the age of Shakespeare that was interesting to uh, you people. So hope to see you again. Have a nice day. Allah Fez.